Welcome, everyone, back to the podcast of champions. I'm David Woods from Bruin Report Online, the UCLA site on the 24 7 Sports Network. And I'm Ryan Abraham <laughs> from USCFootball.com, 24 7 Sports site that covers the USC Trojans. Together, good save. We make. <laughs> The podcast of champions. Talk it all things today. ACC football <laughs> <laughs> used to be Pac-12 football. That's no more. No, it's a silly morning. Uh, we shouldn't be that silly because we have a very special guest today. Uh, Jackson Moore covers all kinds of teams for twenty four seven Sports, including Cal and Stanford, who, if you don't know, are in the freaking ACC. So we're going to talk about that. If you have any questions for us. Packable podcast at gmail.com. You can call or text us at 424-532-0678 or tweet us at Pack 12 Podcast. Please follow us and rate us five stars on Spotify and Apple Podcasts, wherever you get your podcasts. And you can follow Jackson, Jackson Moore at, at Jackson Moore 247. I've known Jackson a long time. Back in the day, I used to run the Bark Board. Have you guys heard of that? Yeah, the Fresno State site uh, for Scout. Jackson runs it now, but uh, yeah, we were, we've been buddies since then. So Jackson, welcome to the show. How you doing, man? I'm doing good. Thank you guys for having me. Uh, it's great. Yeah, we, it's, it's unfortunately we're talking about two ACC programs now, but that's, it's funny. It made you laugh. Uh, and I'm a little loopy. USC had a 530 in the AM spring practice this morning. I've already been to. Uh, thanks to Chris Trevino, he brought a donut, so I had that. But um, yeah, so I'm working on a little bit of sleep and uh, rolled right into the studio from USC. So uh, it's going to work, but we're going to, we got to talk some stuff. We got to talk some ACC powers. We do. Stanford and Cal. Uh, who do we want to start with today? Well, I wanted to do maybe the, the little news. Uh, well, first, we got to do a, we got to do our read. Um, wow, this is really. Smooth. It's doing well. You're the one that tried to jump into the things too fast. But well, uh, you're just babbling over there about how you didn't get enough sleep, and I'm like, I God, do I have to shoulder this entire load today instead of 95 percent of it? Well, it was a long weekend. I was in Vegas. Oh gosh, my first time. Never been. What Vegas. a trial. First time. It was fun uh, because there's so many games going on, and that's why it's great. March Madness is awesome for my bookie. You can experience the thrill of March Madness. So if you don't have your sports book yet, you're in the hunt for one. You can bet the nonstop action of March, March Madness over at our friends at my bookie. You can enter the bracket contest for a chance to win prizes up to twenty five thousand bucks, or pick from a huge selection of straight bets, props, parlays, odds bets, lots of stuff there. Whatever your style, my bookie makes it easy to play your way and get paid. So sign up now, take advantage of our generous welcome offer to score a massive first deposit bonus of up to one thousand dollars. You have to use our promo code. We're going to keep it. Even though the conference doesn't exist, Pac-12, promo code Pac-12 for that first deposit bonus up to a thousand bucks. What's the best part about my bookie? You can bet on anything, anytime, anywhere over only at my bookie. Make sure you use the promo code Pac-12 for that huge deposit bonus. Uh, all right, guys. Um, yeah. You're a March Madness fan, Jackson? Oh, yeah. Well, you know, coming from the Mountain West originally and the whack even before that cover and i i tend to like more of the upsets and the cinderellas and there's there's not much of that this year so i'm a little bit checked out already <laughs> yeah there were some early upsets and then it's been chalky um uh, uh -huh. sort of, you know a little bit of that but i want to talk about too and get your th thoughts on this too jackson um so the the pack two or whatever the four the the, the teams that are leaving uh, Oregon State, Washington State uh, they came to an agreement and it's been finalized there's a settlement so Oregon State, Washington State will get $65 million. So it's $5 million. It's going to be withheld for the departing schools in the revenue. Plus, there's going to be a supplemental payment of $1.5 million. So that's through June of 2024. Also, they came to the agreement that the departing members, they're not, they can't try to dissolve what was left of the Pac-12, the Pac-2. Um, and they're not going to get any revenue for 2025 and beyond. So... The longer Arizona runs in the, the March Madness this year, the more money um, that Oregon State and Washington State will get in those units. I think it's $2 million a game 
going forward. And the Pac-12 did pretty good. You know, getting four teams in was pretty lucky. So pretty good payday for Oregon State and Washington uh, State. They will still be under the the Pac-12 moniker, I guess, for the next two years uh, during that grace period. Uh, but, you know, Jackson, start with you, and then we'll get, Dave, your thoughts on uh, the settlement and everything that's kind of going on in the Pac-12 or Pac-2. Well, I mean, it seems to set the table for Oregon State and Washington State to survive as the Pac-2 for these two years and give them a chance to rebuild and try to build out a conference. And that's what I've been really keeping my eye on. I know there's hope over there that Cal and Stanford may regret where they're going and come back. Um, there's narratives on the Mountain West side that they think all 12 are going to join the two at some point. And I think that's the worst case scenario for Oregon State and Washington State. I don't think they want that at all. Um, so it'll be interesting to see where it hits somewhere in the middle. I think at the end of the day, probably a conference of maybe eight, include some Mountain West schools, maybe grab a couple in American athletic land and try to put together enough of a payday that's greater than the current group of five. That's about all I, the only way I can see this going from here. Yeah, I mean, I just consider it inspiring uh, the way Oregon and Arizona have banded together uh, to make money for uh, their former conference foes. Um, you know, it's it's truly, uh, it's it tugs at the heartstrings. Oregon competing so hard in that last game, the one they lost, uh, to, to just make an extra couple of bucks for Oregon State was uh, <laughs> one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen in uh, college sports. And it's just those kinds of moments where you're sitting there watching you know, relatively underpaid uh, athletes uh, just making money for a neighboring institution with their work and, and sweat and all that sweat equity. It's just, uh, it's what March Madness is all about, you know? It's all about those units. Um, and so, uh, you know, whenever we're watching March Madness, I know I do this and I'm sure everyone out there does. Like, yes, you're following along with your bracket. You've got maybe a favorite team that made it, uh, not UCLA fans this year, but maybe you do. Uh, but really all you're looking at is the conferences and how many units they're getting. Um, and so tracking those units as they go, wow, inspiring stuff. I guess Colorado gets a – I think they got a full unit just for winning the play-in game or whatever they call it, the first four games. Yeah, so, so they got they got, they got got two units because they got one for the play-in and then one for the first round. Yeah. So then I mean, the units, they're just piling up. <laughs> I mean, from a unit standpoint, I think the Pac-12 is in really good shape in this tournament, the last ever tournament, and uh, the Pac-2 will be the beneficiaries. Yeah, but I like, Jack, what you said. I mean, it this does look, you know, financially, there's some, I mean, it makes it viable, I think, for Oregon State, Washington State to kind of survive for a little while, figure out what's going on. They're, you know, Washington or somebody can't come in and try to shut the conference down so that, you know, it's all this that's going to be, I don't know why I said Washington just picked the school, but um, it's all like, we got an alarm going on here. Um, Jackson, you got to get out of the place. You got to get, you got to leave. <laughs> this is a prison break. Is this us or is this him? No, no, I think this is us. Yeah, Do we is. have to get out of here? No, I don't. <laughs> I don't think so. This is an old building. It can't burn. Um, it's just like all cement. Uh, it's in here, right? Yeah, it totally is. Yeah, sorry. This is great, uh, great radio and stuff. Um, <laughs> all right, well, we can move on. Um, we can talk first. Why don't we do this first? California Golden Bears. <laughs> yeah, because the Bears, the Bears, they are actually practicing. There's a couple names that, you know, you guys heard of like Jay Not, like pretty freaking good. Fernando Mendoza, I mean, he was just a superstar last year. Uh, I believe four practices are in the books, Jackson, and uh, now they're on spring break. But wanted to get, I know you you were down there checking it out. What you know, wanted to get your thoughts on uh, what it looked like in Berkeley for uh, Justin Wilcox and the boys uh, for the first uh, week or so of spring practice. Yeah, there's quite a bit of changes in terms of. 20 plus newcomers, and I mean, it's about the norm these days, <laughs> wherever you look. Um, offensive coordinator change, the Jake Spavadol really gave a boost to this program last year, and now his offensive line coach, Mike Blesh, has taken that over, and got a new quarterback battle. You've got Fernando Mendoza coming back as the returning starter, but Chandler Rogers from North Texas, who put up well over 3,000 yards, had a big season there, uh, is coming into battle for that job. Uh, 
about a whole new wide receiver unit. They've lost a couple of their stars. They brought in a bunch of transfers, guys like Mikey Matthews from Utah, Tobias Merriweather from Notre Dame uh, already taking first team reps. Um, I mean, the offense looks quite a bit different across the board and defensively, not a whole lot of changes there. Um, they have added as well an influx of talent at the defensive backfield. Uh, Marcus Harris coming from Idaho, a couple of junior college transfers, uh, Jair Smith and Isaiah Crosby. Some of those guys have already made some pretty spectacular plays. Uh, Harris, who, while coming from the FCS, I know he got a transfer portal rating of 93 from 24-7 and had a backhanded, one-handed interception. It was just one of the craziest plays I've seen in a, a practice setting. So uh, some splashes from the newcomers and uh, a few other holes to fill. We'll see if they get it done in spring or if they got to go back into the portal to get that done. Jackson, so um, wh one thing that's kind of curious for me about Cal, um, and this is just maybe from a general standpoint, but also specifically to NIL, is on one hand, we have California, the university, uh, begging for loose change off of UCLA uh, for leaving to go to the Big Ten, right? Like just kind of scrambling, like pulling up couch Calimony. cushions. Calimony, Calimony. Right. Pulling up the couch cushions, trying to shake what's loose out of UCLA. But then on the other hand, they are getting guys to stay, Jade Knott, and then picking up what was a pretty coveted transfer in Tobias Merriweather. What's your sense of the complexion of Cal's financial situation in terms of booster resources and IL resources because it doesn't seem as non-competitive as like just a, a an outside observer would think. Yeah, the the NIL situation seems to be pretty decent all things considered. They are still getting some guys poached, uh, Jeremiah Hunter off to Washington, you know there's seems to be a few of those examples every year now with the way things have shifted, but I mean they're still bringing in a lot of guys and a lot of Decent players that seem to command some NIL, not top dollar guys by any means, but again, as mentioned, Merriweather. I mean, I'm sure that was costly. Uh, Matthews is a four star guy who put up a decent amount of yards at Utah as a true freshman. Um, I'm sure, Rogers was wanted as the quarterback coming in from North Texas. Uh, they added a, a few different O linemen in this transfer portal class that were had a whole lot of offers, and O linemen are not cheap by any means, even if you're not a top guy. So, uh, I mean, they're not in the top tier shape by any means for NIL, but they're a whole lot better off, it seems like, than a lot of schools, um, and especially a wide gap between them and the type of group of five opponents that are around their region who you know, look like for a little bit there that they might be joining if that ACC situation didn't work out. So uh, there's a lot of backing, a lot of boosters, and while the big dollar figures of running the whole department seem relatively bleak uh, they are getting a decent amount of change in to get players in and build a roster and they've kind of taken the one-year roster approach there at cal they're going to be flipping the roster over massively each year as long as the staff's there uh speaking of nil uh we got a super chat i just want to throw it out there matt washington state head coach uh taking stanford's basketball jobs uh i think he's talking like yeah so stanford took Washington State's basketball coach. We'll talk about that in a few minutes when uh, uh, we talk about Stanford. But we're going to stick with Cal for right now. But thanks, Matt, for the uh, super chat. That's really nice of you. That's our little NIL fund, Jackson. That we, uh, you know, <laughs> we're going to have like a pizza party or something afterwards. Um, yeah, the the roster turnover is interesting. Is this you know going into the ACC? Did it change anything on the recruiting trail? Could you know build some bigger classes, kind of building for the future, or is it just going to be the way this is going to be constructed is, uh, you know, try to keep some of these guys, but there's going to be just expected there'll be turnover uh, every year. Yeah, I think they've just hit that point in general. Um, the staff recruited kind of outside of its league a little bit, like a lot higher than normal in that 2019, 2021 stretch. And they got to the point in 22 and 23 where it was time for a lot of those guys to take over, maybe 21 and 22 more specifically. And, uh, some of the guys didn't pan out, some of the guys that did left and took in high deals to other schools, and it just seemed like it was time to kind of, you know, they had built a core and they needed to scrap a little bit of it and kind of start over. They ended up with 50 newcomers last year, and I think that's just the idea now moving forward is that they're going to um, 
flip the roster quite a bit each year, um, bringing a whole lot of transfers, a lot more than they do in the high school ranks, and, and try to just improve the roster from a year-to-year -year basis instead of building long-term. And going into the ACC, they've said it's helped them a bit in Texas, where they do the staff likes to recruit a lot. It's helping them just be a little more geographically relevant to those players, and they're getting better feedback. Um, I haven't seen them recruit a whole ton on the East Coast. There's been some that they've targeted in past classes. I don't think that's going to jump a whole lot, but um, California, Texas, and just generally nationwide is what they're going to be doing here. Justin Wilcox, I mean, it feels, again, this is like kind of outside observer. It feels like he should have or was on the hot seat in varying ways for many years now. I mean, it was four straight, well, it's now, it is four straight losing seasons thanks to the bull lost. Uh, is it is it strictly the uncertainty around the program, given the move to the ACC, the conference realignment, all that kind of stuff, that he still has a job there? Because it just doesn't, it doesn't seem like the results necessarily um, uh, should indicate what is now going to be his eighth year at the helm. <laughs> yeah, I'd, I'd say uh, the uncertainty paired with the extension he signed not that long ago, uh, once he got on the books long term, and they made that long term commitment, uh, uh, paired with some of the financial stuff we were talking about earlier. I don't think they have any intention of going away unless they just hit rock bottom, which. That's kind of been the other part, too, is that while they've had a lot of losing seasons, they haven't necessarily been awful. They've been you know, a couple of wins away from bowl eligibility and had a couple, quite a few close losses in a lot of those seasons. So uh, if you're just in a, a place where you have to move on, you know, they haven't quite hit that. And they're kind of been stuck in no man's land a little bit and with just enough promise to keep moving forward. And ultimately, they need to turn a corner or... I mean, this can't go on five, six, seven, even under 500 seasons in a row. But um, just last year, as an example, they fixed the offense a bit. The defense slid backwards, and now they got to find a way to get over that six and seven hump this year. Well, that's a good segue. If you want to talk about what the record should be, we got to look at the teams that they're playing. It should be a normal schedule, though, for an ACC team, you know? <laughs> You pull up, so just everyone out there in uh, podcast land, just pull up Cal's schedule. Yeah, really take it in for a second. Yes. Like, we'll just kind of vamp here for a second, but really, like, kind of stare at it. Yeah. You know, it's like you don't drink the wine right away. <laughs> you smell, the, you get check the legs, smell the bouquet, put a little, like, swish a little on your, your tongue. You're not swallowing it yet. This is one, this is a tough one to swallow. <laughs> uh, at Auburn. In oh. September. Yeah, uh, Jordan uh, Hare Stadium. I've been there. It's crazy. Alabama, nice place to be in September. No, <laughs> uh, San Diego State's coming to Berkeley. Hey, not too bad. Yeah, um, at Florida State in September. Is Tallahassee a nice place to be in September? No, Northern Florida <laughs> is very south. Um, <laughs> Miami, but at home. Yeah, that's that's at home. You're gonna go at Pitt, Pittsburgh at Pitt. <laughs> yeah, there's that. That's a thing. Uh, North Carolina State. Coming to uh, coming to Berkeley, um, Oregon State. Now that's a cool one. Uh, you remember that school uh, at Wake Forest? Going to uh, what used to be the Carrier Dome Q's. It's called like JW Marriott or something. I don't know what it's called now, but uh, no. But they're actually coming uh, to Berkeley. Uh, Stanford is a home game, and then uh, at SMU. So going to Dallas uh, on November thirtieth uh, for that one, but. There's a, it, it doesn't look like, I mean, you gotta be pretty good, I think, to get a, make a bowl this year, I would think, because the schedule is not, um, is not easy. If that's fair. Yeah, I would say the part that stands out to me is that the Pac-12 has just been so loaded the last year or two, and you had nine conference games, and I would look at Cal's schedule and I'd say, there's like six teams there that they just can't beat no matter how much they improve. <laughs> and they're going to have to go lights out in the other games. And they did got pretty close to that last year. Um, but then you look at this schedule, you're there in the ACC. I, I don't think there's quite as many top-end teams there. Uh, you're having eight conference games and four non-conference games. Cal's at home seven times out of five. And while it seems rather ridiculous, a lot of these trips they're making, I mean, 
you look from September 21, where they go to Florida State, and November 8th, when they go to Wake Forest, uh, they leave Berkeley one time in those, what, six, seven weeks in between that. Um, so they've got seven home games, five road games. It's There's a lot more uh, fluctuality for this team to put together a better record, I think. There's, there's not as hard of a ceiling on this schedule, but there's also not a lot of easy wins either. So I just think there's a lot of variance for how this season can go for Cal. And um, there are a couple of weeks that the travel is going to be challenging. And But most of the season, I think, is going to look nor relatively normal compared to the situation they're in here. Yeah. What, what's your sense of, I mean, I know with uh, UCLA and USC, there was a lot of hot talk about like building a facility in Chicago or whatever to like house the teams. I don't know where any of that is. I don't think it's going to happen. Probably not. Uh, but uh, is Cal doing anything uh, to mitigate? Because they're making, I mean, Dallas is just barely not, but otherwise they're making four East Coast road trips and then the road trip to Dallas. Uh, are they doing anything to mitigate, like, I don't know, the challenges of that? Are they putting any special prescriptions in order, or is Justin Wilcox kind of in the same denial boat as every uh as the Big Ten coaches are who are saying, oh, yeah, it's no big deal because you fly in on a Thursday and you're out on a Sunday or whatever. Like, is that basically what Cal's plan is? Like, just kind of treat it as normal? Yeah, there there was some brief talks about Cal, Stanford, and SMU trying to collaborate in Dallas. I don't think that ever got off the ground very far. Um, I think what the ACC has tried to do inherently is make the schedule where there's as little of it as possible, I believe, I'm not mistaken, each ACC school for football is only going to travel to the Bay Area once every two years. Um, so there's not a lot of impact on those schools. It's pretty rare that they're going to have to come out to the West. And then for Cal and Stanford, uh, they only have to make three East Coast trips every year. If they schedule regionally in the non-conference. They've got their own games between themselves, and SMU is not too bad of a travel. Uh, the schedule is a bit more manageable. But the problem with Cal is they already had Auburn on the books and they got to go there and uh, going to Auburn and Florida State twice in three weeks is pretty ridiculous. And if you look, I mean, the ACC road games where they're going past Texas are September 21st, October 12th, November 8th. It's pretty spread out. That's good. They just yeah. got a bad situation with Auburn already on the schedule. So it's not too bad, all things considered, once they have more of a opportunity to put the non-conference schedules in consideration for what they're doing at in conference now. Yeah. I think the, um, you'd like some of the, like the, they play three California teams, but they're all at home. Like those would be good road games. Cause you don't have to go as far like Oregon state's at home. Like that would be a nice road game, but, uh, but it makes sense. But yeah, I mean, if they start playing well, like I don't you know, but you know, there, you have to play pretty well. Like you can, you can lose every week, but I think there's a lot of winnable games here too, but it's really it's just looking at the schedule, though. It's just like, holy cow, that looks pretty different. Yeah, the reality of it slaps you in the face. <laughs> it is. ACC, yeah. baby. Um, okay, do we want to switch over? To Stanford? We could go to, you know, that's my thing, dude. Sorry. Stanford Cardinal. Sorry, do it. You do it. I just did it. No, but do it. You want to do it? Stanford? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, no spring uh, football yet. So we can kind of talk some offseason stuff. They're, they're on spring break, and then the quarter starts, and then they get to practice. Jackson, is that how it's going? Yeah, they they have a few transfers coming in, and they don't uh, enroll until the next quarter, which begins first week of April. So that's been kind of the protocol here the last couple of years is that they'll wait for the next quarter and put some behind a little bit. Last year, they also had their spring game kind of in the middle of spring ball. They had the fans out, had the TV crews out, at the midway point and then went back and practiced some more. So they're going to have to be a little unconventional here with uh, how they operate for spring practice. All right. Oh, we got a, we got a super chat um, from Ross. Be warned. The Zodiac is watching. Whoa. Oh, so the Zodiac killer. He's on, he's on board. Do you want to, should we start with Kyle Smith or do you want to get to football first, David? What would you like? I would like to talk about Kyle Smith. Let's do that. Uh, Kyle Smith. Uh, for those who don't know, seeing as this is a football podcast, uh, and Ryan doesn't know. He's like Kyle Smith. That sounds like a that He's a sounds, water polo guy, right? That sounds like an NPC. That sounds yeah. like somebody who actually doesn't exist. Uh, Kyle Smith, the I won't say long time, but I think the last four or five years, uh, the Washington State uh, head basketball coach, previously at USF, previously at Columbia, uh, has 
taken the Stanford uh, basketball job, which was um, held by Jared Haas. Haas? Haas? What do we go with here? Anyone? I don't know. Doesn't matter. Haas Haas. Haas. Uh, Who sucked really bad. Terrible coach. Um, He has finally been fired. Uh, Gave a very nice speech afterwards, which was uh, maybe the best thing he did in his entire tenure. Um, He's finally been fired. Kyle Smith is an actual real head coach who should be good there. Uh, Jackson, what's your sense of this? Is Stanford actually going to be serious about its basketball program now, unlike the last, I don't know, 20 years since Mike Montgomery left? Or is this just uh, scrambling and trying to find somebody who would take the job? I think that's a good fit for that scenario. I think that if Kyle Smith hadn't spent as much time as he did at San Francisco, he was an assistant at St. Mary's for a long time. Um, if Washington State wasn't getting demoted in the conference landscape, that all of this probably doesn't make a lot of sense. It, there's a lot of things that line up here for Stanford to get itself a pretty solid coach and for Smith to take a job that you know, he probably could have landed at some spots that were a little better off with everything but uh, in the current landscape. But you also look at uh, Coach Haas's, Haas's roster and – I mean, that he's got Spencer Jones, probably an NBA draft pick, graduating three of 24-7 sports, like top five players in the transfer portal are guys from Stanford. I mean, putting together a roster was not a problem for the Cardinal over the last few years. They just they never turned it into much of anything productive in terms of wins and losses. They had a good night every now and then, a couple of big upsets, but never really a tournament resume on their schedule. So uh, this is a coach that can do – more with less, as proven. Um, on paper, Stanford's roster should have been a million times better than Washington State's. The Cougars beat the Cardinal three times by double digits this past year. And so that sounds like a, a, an upgrade to me, <laughs> head coach. Uh, the biggest question is going to be, can they retain some of the guys that hit the portal already? And can Stanford, a school that has strict admissions, obviously, and trouble with the transfer portal, if he gets stuck inheriting, like, two, three scholarship guys, is he going to be able to put a roster together for next season? Uh, That's going to be tough. But uh, once things are kind of stable out, they should be able to put together uh, on paper, pretty good roster and hopefully a coach that can take advantage of it. Ryan, just to educate you, because I know you don't follow uh, basketball, the sport, the round ball sport. Uh, Jared, I'm not, I'm not just maligning Jared Haas. Uh, he's a terrible coach. Uh, he went under 500 at Stanford. That's hard to do in college basketball, acquiring any level of talent. Yeah. We're we're under threat again from uh, forces da, da, beyond da, da. our understanding. Um, but he was he was he was under 500 in his tenure at Stanford. The last Stanford coach uh, who was under 500, you have to go back to something called Tom Davis. From his last year was literally the year I was born. Wow. Uh, and he was a game under 500. Um, last time UCLA won a Rose Bowl, right? Yeah, fuck you. <laughs> uh, so anyway, th- that's been our little basketball talk. But yes, I agree with you, uh, Jackson. Uh, Kyle Smith should be an upgrade. And um, God, hopefully Stanford puts this tenure behind them. Was there any like Mark Madsen talk? Because like, we were at Pac-12 we are at the Pac-12 basketball tournament. He signs the extension with Cal, and it seemed like that was sort of a way to like fight Stanford off, who probably should have hired him the year before when Cal did. Screwed that up. Uh, he has a good year at Cal and seems very happy there. But was there was there kind of talk about Madsen? Uh, there were rumblings there towards the end of the season, especially just fans pointing out, hey, we messed up. We should have moved last yeah. year and got that we guy. We screwed this up. Yeah. Um, and there was, you know, you hope the door was kind of cracked open to maybe fix that. And I think just Cal slammed that door shut when they got him on the extension. I don't think it got much farther after that point. Um, but Smith, still a nice hire. Coined the phrase nerd ball. I mean, what better place for him to land than Stanford with that kind of a scheme? <laughs> that is a good, uh, I like nerd ball. That's good. <laughs> Um, well, where are we with Stanford football? Uh, no practice yet, but like we got Troy Taylor where I got the picture of him. Um, where is it, what's the excitement level now? Like what's in, what, what's been kind of happening this off season? Like fill us in uh, what's been going on. Yeah, the, this 
the staff put together its first full class. Uh, quite a few of them are enrolling early, which was unheard of a few years ago. Uh, they had their first two uh, during 2020, I believe, and now there's about six or seven of them in this class, including the freshman quarterback, Elijah Brown, who brings some hope and maybe that he'll be the guy at quarterback, had a great career at modern day. Um, one of the top quarterbacks that's come in for quite some time, uh, last four or five years or so, and has a chance to maybe at least make a case for in the spring that he's going to be able to lead the team or if it's going to be kind of more of the same for Stanford. Um, not a lot they can do in the portal still. There's a couple of additions, but not necessarily huge names at critical positions if you're just kind of glancing over the roster. But um, I think this is a rebuild that's probably going to take two or three years to kind of cycle through some classes, get some guys out of there that uh, didn't pan out. Um, when you think about a team that can't use the transfer portal a whole lot, uh, you got to be really efficient with those classes and, and kind of turn over the roster as much as you can to take care of the spots where you didn't pan out. And I think they've done a little bit of that so far, but it's going to take a couple of these classes. I, I like the way they've recruited. Uh, and then you just look at the schedule ahead. And again, much like Cal, there's not those same teams where you just automatically ride in the L's, um, but there's also uh, a lot of teams that are probably better than what the Cardinal are right now. So tough sledding again this year, but hopefully they can kind of get over some of those humps and, and show some progress from year one to year two and under Taylor. So in year one for Taylor, there was a, uh, I, I felt, so it obviously wasn't good three and nine, um, but I, I still didn't feel like it was, you know, like with David Shaw, I felt like he was committing like war crimes against the sport of football um, every single time he was coaching a game the last three years. Troy Taylor, I didn't feel that. I felt like he was trying to put him in the best position to win. He didn't have a lot of quarterback talent or any kind of credible play there. Um, but there were just results that like they would get blown out, but then they would play cl close games. What's the general sense of the job he did in year one uh, among the fan base? What, you know? what exists of the fan base. We have two of the most passionate five Stanford fans who listen to this show. Um, yeah, but, uh, shout out to Matt. Yeah, um, but what's, the, I mean, I guess what's the general sense of the job he did in year one? Are people generally excited? Um, are they cautiously optimistic? What's, what's your sense? I think there were some flashes. I, I think the best thing to point out here is the year before David Shaw went three and nine and that team had five NFL draft picks including an NFL quarterback and they had about 20 players transferred to power five schools that offseason and almost all of them started there yeah. and so yeah. Troy Taylor inherited virtually again nothing. war crimes <laughs> yeah I mean <laughs> just kind of scratching at getting quarterback play they had almost no running backs the, the backup quarterback was running the ball a lot towards the end of the year uh, a just Mash unit on the O line, the true freshman out there, <laughs> and they had some moments. They, of course, the win at Colorado. Um, they had some games. They probably could have pulled off if they had a little more to work with. It was, of course, the Sac State game. I mean, they <laughs> there's no excuse for letting that one get away. But you can see if they just had a couple more pieces, maybe they could have gotten one or two more wins on last year's schedule and. Um, so I think there's optimism. It's just um, the gap between optimistic at three and nine and two Rose Bowl wins and you know, the word this program was not that long ago uh, is a long way to go. And will this be the, the group that gets there? Um, there's still a, a lot to prove, I think. Mark in the chat says, uh, Shaw should have gone to UCLA, LOL. Yeah. <laughs> I still can't. He's going to do that. If you So here's where Stanford football is right now, David. If you go to like the Stanford, the official Stanford like Twitter feed, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, it's, mm -hmm. it's pages and pages of Joshua Cardi uh, kicking uh, pro day stuff. It's like, oh, more Josh. I think there was like a, they have like a Christian McCaffrey thing pinned from before, but like, Oh, Joshua Cardi. Oh, who can make six? Like, so there's a lot of Joshua Cardi. So that's kind of where Stanford football is. No, right and here's now. the big question. Yeah. How do you replace Joshua Cardi? <laughs> I, you know, I don't know. I want to know the answer to this. Like, what, what's, what's, what's the kicking depth? How's that competition previewing? Like, what are we talking about here? Because that is Stanford's sole offense the last two years. <laughs> More than two. Yeah, at least more than two. 
Yeah. Do, do we have any information on the kicking competition? <laughs> uh, I mean, Cardi's going to be tough. He, even at that pro day, he went three for three from 60 out. <laughs> um, they only bring back one solely listed kicker, Emmett Kenny, who's a senior who's been there for a while. Um, they've got the young guy, Aiden Flintoft, who was a pretty highly rated recruit. He's listed as punter and kicker. So um, we'll see kind of what those two guys do over uh, spring and see if they have anything close to the type of leg they had before. Yeah. For those concerned, I just got an email from the building. We wanted to inform you that we are currently conducting our fire inspection. During this time, there may be instances where the fire alarm sounds. Please be assured that these alarms are part of our testing process and there's no need for concern. So those of you that wanted us to run out of the building, we are totally <laughs> fine. It's not on fire. It was just a drill. Um, speaking of fire drills, let's look at Stanford's schedule. <laughs> it's honestly, I think to me, funnier than the uh, Cal schedule. Is it funnier? It's a little bit funnier. Look at their back-to-back -back in September. So you got uh, TCU Friday at Stanford. Yeah, easy. Cal Poly. Yeah, easy. Okay. Uh, then going at Syracuse to uh, so ACC play. I believe that's on a Friday night too. Friday night at Syracuse. Uh, okay, that'll be fun. Uh, and then at Clemson. <laughs> so that's like, do you just stay? Well, that's like an extra day too. Yeah. Because, like, if it was, like, a Monday game, then you could just stay on the East Coast, you know. But with, like, Friday game, I don't think they're going to allow them to uh, miss all that school. Uh, Virginia Tech at home. Uh, at Notre Dame. That's been on that schedule. SMU is coming to the Bay Area. Fast forward to the dumbest thing, which is at the end of the schedule. Okay, hold on. Wake Forest, home. At NC State. I forgot how much you love to read. Louisville at home. <laughs> at Cal. And then at San Jose State, because why would you want that? Why? Why are they playing at San Jose State? <laughs> why did this happen? How? Tell me everything. <laughs> yeah, it's like a four-year home-and-home agreement, too. They're going to make a couple of these trips. <laughs> Jeez Louise. Wow. That's so bad. That's like the time. Were you covering them when they did the at UCF trip? Uh, what was that, like two or three years ago, four years ago, something like that? That was before me, unfortunately. Oh, my yeah. God. Bizarre scheduling from the Stanford Cardinal. But any thoughts on the schedule? Like, where, you know, how's it stack up with the Cal one? What, what do you think about Stanford's chances here? Yeah, the, I mean, at Syracuse, at Clemson in eight days, the, the Syracuse game's a Friday, so it separates it by one extra day. But, I mean, that's more brutal than anything on Cal's schedule. Um, then after that, there's not a whole lot. Again, like Cal going to Auburn, you got Stanford at Notre Dame. Of course, that was on the books, uh, and I don't think that's going away anytime soon, so they're just going to have to deal with that in terms of building schedules moving forward. Um, after October 12th, they leave the state of California one time to go to NC State, and they get a bye week right after. So after that brutal run uh, of traveling, they don't have to do much of it. Last two home games, they don't even leave the Bay Area, so... Uh, and you look at kind of the top end teams, they got to go to Clemson, they got to go to Notre Dame, a lot of beatable teams elsewhere, if they can be good enough to be a team that can beat them. Um, but yeah, and Stanford also has some weird things where you know, the schedule early in the season um, with the quarter system, they like that early bye week. Uh, they're having the bye week after their first two home games, which Probably won't have a lot of student body there based off the academic schedule and um, it would have been nice that's one part about the cal schedule is that the travel looks nice probably aided a bit because there's two bye weeks this year and it feels like that first bye week for stanford got kind of thrown away if they're having to go to syracuse and clemson right after it yeah uh that's weird sunny dykes does come to the bay Air again though tcu mm -hmm. coming back there so, you go yeah there's something uh, Jackson, um, Stanford, uh, the, the, the complexion of Stanford's NIL situation has been kind of weird to follow. Um, it, for a while, it sounded like they were rejecting the entire idea of NIL, but then I was hearing stuff that Troy Taylor was trying to make things happen there. Now Stanford, I mean, so many ungodly wealthy alum, uh, uh the, the <laughs> alumni base is absolutely, um, gobsmackingly wealthy. It's probably like a trillion dollars in there. What um what's your sense of 
like are they have they shown more of a willingness to get involved in the NIL game um, in recruiting? And I mean, it, are, are there any? I mean, because I know Phil Knight was given money to Stanford for a while because of his connection to, I believe, the business school. What are are there benefactors in that alumni base who actually even give a crap about sports? And if so, will they pony up for NIL? There are, and there's been an effort going on. There just hasn't been a whole lot of public communication about it. And there's a lot of that at Stanford. It's a private university. You know, you don't see coach salaries and that kind of thing. So it's, you're kind of used to that stuff running behind the scenes. The fact that Stanford is very limited with what it can do in the portal, um, that's where most teams' NIL money is going. So there's not a need for Stanford to have the NIL for the portal, at least, at least right now unless they change some things, make it a little more uh, easier to get some of those players in. So I would assume it, it, there's what's mostly for the high school ranks. Um, they've been recruiting well. Um, the, the hope all along was that the Stanford name and the academic opportunities would overpower the NIL opportunities that you could get elsewhere. But I think they're trying to balance that right now to where they have enough to bring players in. Um, at least on the basketball side, you see I've seen them getting top-notch recruits every year. Uh, football is not necessarily getting the, the elite recruits, but they're putting together pretty solid classes right now, and I imagine they needed a bit of NIL to make that happen. All right, the great Jackson Moore. Follow him on Twitter, at Jackson Moore 247 uh, Does a really good job covering a lot of teams here on the West Coast for the 24-7 Sports Network, including... ACC members Cal and Stanford. Still weird to say that every time I do. Uh, but Jackson, thanks so much for taking some time uh, and joining us this morning. Uh, it was great stuff. And uh, yeah, looking forward to it. We're, you know, we'll keep covering these teams. Looking at that schedule, that's going to be a lot of fun. So for both, both Cal and Stanford. But thanks again for coming on. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. Thanks, Jackson. All right, Jackson. All right, everyone else, we're going to take a break, and we'll come back in a minute. So back in a minute, everybody. All righty. Are we back? We're back. Uh we got to give like a little shout out to uh, Jackson. Thank you. I should do this while I was here. Great stuff. Um, yeah, we knocked out a couple teams. We knocked them out. Uh, yeah, we, we actually were talking about the you – know, at the Pac-12 championship game or uh, Pac-12 tournament about the Mark Madsen stuff because we were talking all kinds of things. Yep. Pac-12 hoops. Uh, but you like the hire. I he's, do. He's a real. He's a Ky real coach. Kyle Smith is good. He's a good coach. Um, he's not a charlatan. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's not Stanford treating their basketball program contemptuously, which is what they've done for the last, I think, three coaching tenures. So we'll see. Um, but if they have a little bit of resources behind them, um, I think Kyle Smith could do some impressive things there. Obviously playing an ACC schedule out of Stanford is going to make that job extremely difficult in some just yeah. on-court ways. Um, but they should be a better functioning basketball team with Smith than they were with um, an empty suit. Um, we're, we're looking football travel first. Mm. And probably Cal and Stanford are the, the – they're, the, they're getting hit the worst, right? Like yeah. they're the most isolated. They're the furthest away. But even like the basketball team, like that's a lot of trips. Yeah, it's um, going to be disastrous. It's going to be horrible. And uh, then all the, I mean, Cal and Stanford, really good at the all ACC, the Olympic sports. Yeah, the ACC made no sense. Like the Big Ten doesn't make any sense, but the ACC makes negative sense. Like it just does not work. They would have been better off trying to make something work with Oregon State and Washington State being like a, you know, whatever, a group of four or whatever. Um, or you know merging with the Mountain West, it's it's extremely stupid what they're doing. It's going to, I mean, obviously, the programs were at such a low point. But I, I don't know, maybe this is just me being bullish generally on Pac-12 schools. But like Stanford, for one, has potential. Um, you know, yeah. they, they've had an elite basketball program. They were elite in football for a good ten years there. 
Cal had, you know, the the Jeff Tedford era where they were pretty good in football. And, you know, the, before, you know, there used to be a joke that, like, Cal was waiting for basketball season because Cal actually gave a crap about basketball. And now it's going to be, you're really going to compete in the ACC? I mean, it's not like it's the ACC of, you know, a decade ago, but it's still a, I mean, it's still North a challenging, a seed, yeah, it's throughout. still yeah. a challenging uh, basketball conference. Yeah. And they're going to do it from the opposite coast? No, they're not. And so it's just, it's a money grab for even less money than what they, what the Big Ten, you know, whores are doing. Um, so it's just, I, I don't get it. Don't get it. I, I'm curious too, because for the football side, the ACC really was trying to limit the number of trips. So like you only have to go to the Bay Area once every other year. Um, on the basketball side, there's probably going to be more trips, right? There's going to be more. They can't get know. around it unless they do some sort of neutral site uh, yeah. jamboree or whatever. But uh, the the thing that struck me about looking at the football schedules is I don't – they did not give any special consideration to Cal and Stanford. I think it was special consideration to their current members to not have to go there too often. But like Cal and Stanford got nowhere near the scheduling consideration that the Big Ten entrance did. Um, like they're not getting any kind of favorable no. look at things. So I, it seems like they're getting uh, nothing from the deal. Like, and in some ways, literally nothing. Aren't they getting paid out nothing for basically or the first whatever? Not much. Not much. Um, I think SMU is getting nothing. I think Cal and Stanford are getting not much. Yeah. Um, and it's just like. What did you get out of this besides more losses? You got out of the a sinking ship. I'm yeah, but it. how much would they like to be splitting those units the next two years? Yeah. Those juicy, juicy units from juicy the NCAA tournament. Um, I just think Oregon State and Washington State, I mean, I know they were out of options, but I think they've played a better game at this than Cal and Stanford. I think they were all dealt a, a, a set of really shitty cards. Um, Oregon State and Washington State played theirs the best they could. Right, Cal and Stanford, I think, did a desperation thing that does not make sense for them and will lead to disaster. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. I think that they've they haven't played their hand as well as, I mean, Oregon State, Washington had the worst hands and they've played it better than some of these other. Yeah, ones. and I mean, like Oregon State, Washington State, are they in great shape going forward? No, but they're not like over leveraging themselves into something that like literally does not make any goddamn sense. They're keeping their options open. Yeah, West Texas Mike, who we met in uh, Vegas. My first time there. Did you know that? That's the first time I went. I yeah. uh, can't wait for them to play the big game in the State Fair, the Cotton Bowl in Dallas. Oh. That's one thing they'll keep local. But yeah. they could have some – maybe they might have something there. And if you guys have uh, questions uh, in the chat, if you're watching us live, thank you for watching us live if you are on the YouTube channel. Um, yeah, and we can uh, – we'll, we'll try to play those. We got a comment from uh, LFG. No worries, ACC will soon implode and maybe Bay Area schools can reconnect with Broke Pack Mountain programs. Credit a voice of the college football YouTube chat member. Mm. Broke Pack Mountain. Mm. Hmm. Mm. Interesting. Mm. Um, mm. Yeah. Uh, Tony asks, David, is Cronin going to schedule Arizona in the near future? Oh, let me put that up there. That's a great question, Tony. Um, near future, no. Uh, maybe in the medium to long-term future. For me, um, I think UCLA should schedule them. I think it would be awesome if they did literally a home-and-home home each season. I know that's non-traditional in uh, non-conference play, but I still think they should. I think it should be two games uh, between the two uh, each season. Uh, the Pac-12 didn't even achieve that in many of the last uh, 15 years because of the stupid flex scheduling. Um, but I think it's, you know, it's, it's the best West coast rivalry in college basketball. And with the death of the PAC 12, uh, something will need to be done to maintain the West coast traditions of basketball here in the, uh, in the fall of the PAC 12. Um, you know, it's sort of like, um, you know, keeping the light of the Roman empire alive after the fall mm. to the barbarians, uh, you know, that, that game can be the Byzantine empire. Okay. You know, keeping keeping civilization, keeping keeping the you know the the works of Library of Alexandria, uh, you know, around for a thousand years. Uh, that can be the UCLA and Arizona rivalry, but it needs to be done. Um, 
And I know there's some complications and there's some bullshit rivalry stuff like, oh, Arizona fans are rabid, you know, uncontrollable animals. And yeah, okay. <laughs> but besides that, um, and frankly, like all that kind of shit, like, oh, wow, they beat up Mick Cronin's dad or whatever, or, you know, they, um, you know, Mac Etienne spit in the face of a bunch of, uh, you know, small Arizona children. Uh, that's the stuff that makes it great. You want that. You want this uh, kind of just uh, uh, stupid fury and stuff. And yeah, if it escalated into something truly serious, it would be bad. But it hasn't really. I mean, Mac Etienne, I don't know. Did he have to do some community service for spitting on some people? Sure. Um, but besides so, that. Yeah, besides that. I mean, it would be great if like uh, the unruly, um, you know, uh, the, the truly bad unruliness were, you know, kind of curbed. But. The game itself is, I think, important enough that you can get past all that stuff. But I don't know if it's going to happen anytime soon. All right. Uh, we also had a basketball question from Chris. Why isn't USC fired Enfield? And uh, I actually got a call. I told David I got a call last night that uh, Andy Enfield was – there was interest from SMU or vice versa. And uh, Pete Thamble reported that this morning. So, yeah, USC was not planning, I'm telling people, that he were not planning on firing Enfield, but he could potentially leave for ACC, new ACC power, uh, SMU. So we'll see kind of what happens there. And we have uh, two West Texas Mikes from West Texas Mike. Um, Ten West Texas Mikes for you two to reissue your Pac-12 eulogies. Mm, mm. Um, and thank you uh, for that, West Texas Mike. Amy says, David isn't hungover. Uh, not sure he can recreate that well thought out, eloquent eulogy. Wasn't good. Wasn't good. Um, yeah, no, I mean, we can definitely do a eulogy episode. I think that should would we be do that? Good. We should do that. We should deliver uh, good eulogies. I like that. Yeah. Um, we both were kind of hungover. I was not as hungover as David. But I'm probably more comfortable with the like, little public speaking thing. Mm. I do like a microphone in my hand. Um, I have a microphone and you don't. So you will listen to every goddamn word I have to say. Not necessarily like that. But uh, I do like that. But uh, yeah. I mean, yeah, the eulogies were fun. Uh, how was our show that I was on the road for? Was that like I was driving to Vegas. First trip ever to Vegas. I mean, uh, you were as much a participant in it as I was. So I don't know. Yeah. I didn't listen to it afterwards. <laughs> Let us know in the chat how crappy last week's episode was. Although people in the chat might not listen to the show. Um, we got breaking news. Can you just hit the breaking news button? Uh, yeah. The best USC basketball coach in probably, maybe ever, certainly 60 years since the days of Bob Boyd, could be leaving. Oh, I said that already. For SMU. I don't care. I don't care what you said already. <laughs> I thought it would like actually happen. I'm like, oh crap, did that happen? How can they allow that to happen? Um, How can you allow one of the one of the true greats in the history of USC basketball to leave for an ACC school? Hmm. An ACC school that just entered the conference for no money. How could you possibly allow this to happen, USC? They got a lot of boosters. Uh, I mean, this is. I mean, this would be a disaster. I think it would set USC basketball back to the days of God. Who was who was the coach when you were there? Uh, one George of those, Raveling. Yeah, one of those chumps. I'd go all the way back to that. Um, they had Harold Miner. There was pretty exciting back then. Yeah, it wasn't. Um, yeah, I mean, this is just. I mean, it, it was it was nightmarish. Um, reading that this morning, I was just. You know, I'm not a USC guy, but I was still. I was heartbroken. I was. Wow. As much how as far Clayton. how far has USC fallen that they're like look, UCLA football lost its head coach to a, a fellow Big Ten school. True. Andy Enfield going For to an ACC school? <laughs> Good God. I mean, how far has that program fallen? Yeah. USC. Boy howdy. You would, would he really... just he just understands I can't win big here. I can't get the kind of talent in here <laughs> that I need to get. Those number one players, those five stars, I just I haven't been able to land. Wait, I'm hearing reports. Oh, he's been able to land many of those. Yes. Oh, weird. Oh, just haven't delivered. Interesting. That'd be one Interesting. of those things where, like, yeah, it would upset 
someone like you because you liked having an Andy Edfield around because he wasn't very good. And that would be like the addition by subtraction potentially. And who knows? Who knows what they'll do? I mean, he's won a bunch of games. They just haven't had like the big time success. And they recruited well, but as you've said, he's not a very good coach. He's a very, very bad coach. <laughs> yeah. We'll see. Um, Kevin in the chat, question for Ryan. What do you make of USC's NIL turnaround? The Athletic dropped an article where USC's budget had tripled. Um, yeah, Kevin. Well, actually, Lincoln Riley talked about it this morning a little bit when I was at football practice. Uh, USC had a huge recruiting weekend. They got they flipped like a five-star defensive lineman who lives in Georgia that was committed to Georgia. And he picked USC. And they got another, the, the number one edge rusher out of Georgia. They ended up getting five commitments over the weekend. Aaron Darnold was on campus, you know, uh, talking with players and stuff, recruits and everything. They were all visiting. Um, yeah, we've heard that they are definitely stepped up their NIL efforts. And uh, Lincoln Riley said as much today. He said just even the last few months, um, it's got significantly better. I don't know. Uh, I wasn't told tripled, uh, but told it significantly. But it's been kind of a steady climb that they're kind of doing a better job with that. Uh, but I think a lot of it, too, has to do with um, just the new staff that they brought in. Like, they they just didn't take defense very seriously. And they got a bunch of dudes now that do. Like, that Eric Henderson guy coming from the Rams, he's just, like, crazy recruiter dude. Um, you know, you can bring in Aaron Donald and have him talk you up. And so defensive linemen want to come play for him. But I think they're doing it better on a lot of different levels. Um and yeah, we'll see. I mean, I think there's just more donors kind of stepping up. I think at a place like USC and not maybe UCLA too, but you're sort of like, you had advantages already. Like we talked about Stanford. Stanford would do things their way because, hey, you can come to Stanford and do this and like hope that that trumps NIL. And USC would hope that like tradition and going to the NFL would trump NIL. And we're, we're realizing that none of that trumps NIL. Like NIL trumps all of that. So you have to take it. Seriously, but at a place like USC and UCLA, you're in LA, very marketable. You can use a lot of that stuff. Um, you can still use the Stanford education and everything's going on there, but it has to be part of the NIL. Maybe you get someone that's, you're not paying as much because of the Stanford education or because of, you can get some kind of endorsement deal in Los Angeles or whatever. You can be an extra on a TV show. I don't know. You got to use that other stuff, but NIL is, is going to be like the big thing. So I think USC is starting to take it seriously. It sounds like Stanford's starting to as well, at, you know, probably at UCLA. So I, yeah, that's just kind of my thoughts on it. Any thoughts, David? Um, I am, I am remembering, uh, uh, this might only be tangentially related. Uh, I, I'm remembering you at the beginning of last year talking up the USC defense. I'm just remembering that right now. Um, they, I listened to what they were telling me. Uh -huh. and it was not. It's not good. I think it'll be very, very funny if they again have a top. I, like, here's the thing. I don't think it can be worse than top fifty-ish, but like, if it is just hovering in the top fifty range, I think it'll be very funny. That's all I got. Yeah. Well, they they got some guy that you saw take a like 90th ranked defense to like a top 20, defense. which is why I think it'll be very funny. Yeah. You don't think it'll be very funny. You think it will be less humorous than I do. Uh, no, I mean, it's just, that's par for the course. If crap like that happens, it's just like, all right, whatever. Um, they got better players. Is that a pin on your hat? It's a, uh, golf marker. Oh yeah. So you, you put it on there. So when you you're on the green, you mark your golf ball. So, so you've got it attached to your hat. It's a little magnet. Yeah. So when you're going up to the ball, you like you take it off. You can put it in your pocket, but it's easy like these little things for golf. You gotta do it like uh, happy Gilmore's caddy and make it a chip. Like a literal They do uh, poker chips are very cop popular. No, no, like a little chip you could eat. Oh. When was the last time you saw Happy Gilmore? It's been a while. Wow. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Nice. You you golf a lot, huh? I like to golf. Mm. I try to. Interesting. I went I golfed in Vegas. It was very windy. Yeah, I bet. My first time ever, Vegas. It was fun. <laughs> Which one was the first time ever? <laughs> I, tried to, I tried to get David to come out. Yeah, I, I'm not that level. I'm not going to Vegas twice in 
two weekends. Not, I did not one. anymore. I've done that before. I once I once drove to Vegas, uh, Vegas, drove back from Vegas, and then got home, and we were like, hmm. <laughs> Do we need to go right back? <laughs> and we did. That, that like we got back, uh, I think at like noon, worked a little bit, and then drove back that night to Vegas. That's pretty amazing. That was like twenty four. It was yeah, yeah. There were moments. I remember one. We were I think I was in my twenties too, and we were drinking in Manhattan Beach, and it was like one of the people weren't drinking. They just got a new car, and it was like midnight, and we we're like. Like, like let's go home and play like we used to play like the dice game to drink you know like there'd be different dice games i forget and they're like dice why don't we go to vegas and like jumped in the car and like the sober person like drove their new car all the way to vegas and like by three in the morning you're like this is a horrible idea yeah but you know but then by um, five in the morning you're like this is a great idea they were there you know and it's like the sun's coming up and stuff you're like okay yeah, that was pretty fun <laughs> beautiful yeah it was good stuff um do we have, we had like one email question, I think. Sure. Fred, uh, is it from Frank? Yeah. He changes his name in the... Oh, Fred in Sarasota. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, dispatches from Nevada. Great to hear that you guys partied hard in Las Vegas. Dave, the term for not brushing your teeth after a night of heavy drinking is, I think a bird shit in my mouth. I like that. I use uh, the goat stampeded. That's what I say to my mm. friends. Uh, the, the goat stampeded. Like because stampeding goats, it just sounds like something that would leave a dry, foul taste. Very in. much, yeah. yeah. Uh, Ryan, the phrase to describe the fear of a really bad hangover is, for a while there, I was afraid I was going to live. That's beautiful. I do and like that. That is so perfect because that is exactly the feeling where it's just like, oh, I don't want to experience this anymore. Like this experience, I'm done experiencing. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's where I was that Friday. In Vegas. You were really bad. Yeah, it was. So we did four thirty in the morning the first night, and then five in the morning the second night. I'm not cut out for that anymore. No, and that that's what I had to like wake up to check out of the room. I was like, oh god, and then take my backpack with me <laughs> and everywhere. Then go to a buffet. <laughs> go to a buffet. <laughs> Shout out to Matt. It was an amazing buffet. It was so good. And then uh, go to the eulogy. Go to the the funeral. And then we went and gambled and. That was kind of fun, and then went to the airport. My flight was delayed too, and I didn't get home till well after midnight. And it was like, oh, that was kind of, uh, that was kind of rough. We did, uh, I kind of did the opposite of that this trip. Like we watched all the Friday games at Circa, the new. Um, they have a really cool. Yeah, it's really there. cool down there. But they have a stadium like pool setting, so like all the TVs up at the pool, and we had like uh, one of my buddies got a cabana thing we had our own little private area so it's like bottle service starting at like nine in the morning and i was like can i get a mimosa and they're like basically it was gonna be like a thousand you had to buy a bottle of champagne we already had a bottle of vodka i'm like okay we just drank vodka so i just kept drinking vodka the whole day and uh probably by six or seven i like irish exit out of there i was like i couldn't do this anymore went home like went back to the room and just passed out i woke up at like midnight and like yeah, and then I brushed my teeth. I'm like, okay, I'm going to bed now. And it was just like crazy. So instead of going to bed at like 5 a.m., it was like 7 p.m. that one night. I was like, I just had too much, you know? Yeah, the best Vegas trip I ever had was for a friend's bachelor party. And the reason it was the best is that uh, there were like eight of us, something like that. Six of the guys go down to the pool at like 2 p.m. after we've already been doing some like day drinking heavily at oh, that point. okay. Um, and me and my other buddy, we go back to the room and we're like, we're just going to take a nap. I'm going to take a nap. You're going to take a nap. And then we wake up at like 4.30 refreshed. Absolutely beautiful. Like feeling like a million dollars. We didn't drink so much that we were like hung over. Yeah. Drank just enough that we're like, oh, I I'm, I'm still feeling it a little bit, but I feel great. They come back sunburnt, broken men, <laughs> drunk as hell. And I'm like, oh, but we still have to go out and do things now. We're going to go do things. Let's all go. And they're just like slowly getting drunker or recovering. And we're just like, you know, bright eyed and bushy tailed. Amazing. And I swore I would always do that going forward. And I haven't done it again since. <laughs> I have not taken a midday nap at in Vegas one time since then. Yeah, that's a tough the midday nap. Tough one. But it's like you just it's all, all or nothing kind of when you go to bed. But that that worked. We had a comment from Blessed Bee. Uh, the curse. 
he disagrees or they disagree uh, regarding Wazoo and Oregon State. First Stanford and Cal going to the ACC. Wazoo and Oregon State are going to be forever relegated to non-power conference status. Stanford and Cal are still alive. No, they're not. That's Come what on, the ACC stop it. Was about. Stop it. Stop the it. ACC might die. Like stop they, it. T- stop telling yourself this. They're not alive. They're not in the SEC and they're not in the Big Ten. So they're not alive. All they have done is take, they have jumped from a ship that was sinking to another ship that is sinking. Oregon State and Washington State have removed themselves to a, a you know, a barren island, but it has some natural resources. <laughs> like they can do some things there. Uh, they're not, they, they recognize we're not getting back to the mainland. Uh, Stanford and Cal have not recognized that yet, but they're not getting back to the mainland. That's not happening in today's college sports. Maybe college sports changes again, but that change, if it comes, is also going to include these two people who are chilling out on the island. And they're going to have a much better time on that island than anyone participating in athletics for Stanford and Cal is going to have over the next, whatever, four to eight years. No, I, I kind of agree with you there. Like, it's unfortunate. Like, I think the Big 12, there's some redeeming qualities, right? Just, I mean, basketball-wise. But other, I mean, with the ACC, it just it's a lot tougher. And, oh, by the way, the two biggest schools are suing the conference trying <laughs> to get out of it. So it's like they are literally trying to kill the conference, and you just got there. Um, so, yeah, that's good. All right, well, I think that's about it. Do you have anything else? We no. want to talk talk about no. That's it for me. Uh, I do appreciate everyone uh, tuning in. Thanks for bearing with us for our show last week. We wanted to do something a little pre March Madness. It was actually as March Madness was starting, uh, but it was just I was traveling and I wasn't able to do it. So we thanks for David for recording that. But we're back here. We still have to get to the um, the Big Ten schools. That's it, right? We talked. We talked to. Oh, we we have to talk to the the pack two. We haven't talked to uh, Oregon State, Washington State yet. So we'll kind of get some off season updates from all those schools. The remaining two, uh, the and the departing uh, for the Big Ten. We already did UCLA. Um, USC's week in, so, or well, I guess four days into spring practice right now. Like I said, there was a five thirty in the morning practice. A lot of optimism there, but we can talk about uh, USC. Uh, Oregon and Washington a little down the road and also Washington state and Oregon state. Uh, But for, I guess that's it. So uh, for David, David Woods, I am Ryan Abraham. Hope you guys enjoyed the show and uh, we will talk to you next time. Goodbye.